I'm going to start with John Searle's Ontology of Social Reality, the early version. Uh, he modified it somewhat in his book, Making of the Social World, in the introduction. Uh, so this is a president, as we can all see. This is a cathedral, and this is a driver's license. And uh, Searle's Ontology explains all of these three kinds of social objects on the basis of this formula, X counts as Y in context C. So a certain human being counts as the president, a certain stone edifice counts as cathedral, a certain piece of paper, cardboard or plastic counts as a driver's license. And in each case, we have an X term, which is physical, a Y term, which is a social object, and certain kinds of beliefs and habits and background and so forth, which form the context. We can iterate this formula. So a cathedral may count as a place for performing certain kinds of ceremonies, for instance. So we can have Y counting as Z and so forth. But the fundamental term, the fundamental X term, has to be physical. Otherwise, it's going to be social objects all the way down, and that would be a problem from Searle's point of view. A much bigger problem for Searle, as he already acknowledged, is that most interesting social objects don't actually satisfy his formula. So things like the obligations, debts, rights, permissions, uh, the sorts of things which arise through promises do not have a physical foundation. <laughs> and so I argued in a paper which convinced Searle that there was indeed a problem here, that we should regard these particular cases as being freestanding Y terms. They are Y terms without an X. And the, the idea was that in the olden times, uh, these freestanding Y terms, for instance, Mary's obligation to John that he would uh, milk his cow the next morning, would be uh, uh, such as to rest upon memories in the heads of Mary and John. But in modern times, you, we need physical artifacts, primarily documents, which maintain the existence of these freestanding Y terms through time because there are representations of the Y term on pieces of paper. And so since then, I've been working on an ontology of social reality in which documents and document systems and document acts play an important role. And um, so this is a document. <laughs> the thesis is that many kinds of human action involve documents. More and more kinds of human action involve documents of a digital sort. And that all of the most interesting problems in the theory of human action in the future are going to have something to do with documents of either the paper or the electronic sort. Um, so, for instance, we sign wills in front of witnesses, we create, thereby create an estate. The estate exists because of the document that we've created, and the document will survive the death of the person who signed it. And similarly, when we enter a country, we show a passport, and that gives us the opportunity, with the aid of the passport uh, officer, to gain legal entry into a new country. And we couldn't do that without the document, which is the passport. Now, in a previous uh, meeting in this room, John Kearns put forward uh, an argument against this idea. He said, well, that's all very well for modern day societies, but there's nothing really new here. All of the essential ingredients in making a will or making a promise or establishing your identity are just good old-fashioned speech acts. And in small communities, everyone trusted each other, everyone knew each other. We wouldn't need documents. We could manage just with speech acts and with the associated memories and so on. Now, I did once live in a very small country. And one of the uh, border posts between Liechtenstein and Austria, which I one day drove through, um, on, on a short trip to Austria, um, looks like this, and it's very rarely the case that anyone is there. 
Uh, so I drove through and then I came back and I came on a different road and I needed to go through here. And I realized that I had forgotten my passport. <laughs> now, that was a sort of problem. So it cost me five dollars and I had to fill in a long paper in which I signed my name, declaring that I did indeed have a residence permit to live in Liechtenstein. Um, but if, if we are all living in small countries or small villages, then we can walk from one village to the next and, and no problems will arise. We can make promises and no problems will arise. So I think John Kearns is wrong. I think that even in small societies of individuals who know each other and who do not cheat each other and who accept the same rules, there are human activities that essentially involve documents. All right? So, and that's what I'm going to try and support. And the strategy is I start just to set the scene with a, an account of war, a very, very simple, simplified ontology of war. I then just provide an ontology of chess. I then talk about the special case of blind chess, which is actually the best case for John Kearns, because blind chess doesn't need any documents or anything like documents. And then finally, I conclude with poker. So war, this is a simple ontology of war. We have two sides, uh, each of which has some leader. And the leader on one side begins thinking in certain ways, and his thinking leads him to perform a speech act uh, or multiple speech acts, which bring about thoughts in the uh, 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 mind of the opposing leader. And uh, the more speech acts are created, until eventually we have people shooting each other. <laughs> well, <laughs> there are three levels here. There are thoughts, speech acts, and people shooting each other. And I, I think that those three levels are essential if you want to have a war. But documents are not essential. There were wars before there were documents. There was no organized warfare before documents, but wars existed almost certainly long before they were documents. Now, Searle so says that chess is, as he puts it, war in attenuated form. So what is a game of chess? Well, a game of chess, the instance, which is the game played by these two players on this day, I think is made up of physical movements of physical pieces of wood or some other material. That's the typical case. But of course, you need to have thoughts and you need to have arm acts or some counterpart of arm acts. Otherwise, the pieces of wood, of wood would not move. So this is, roughly speaking, the, the account of chess as an attenuated form of war. Now, the question is, what is the game here? And I think that the game is made of physical movement of physical pieces of wood. The movements of the arms are not parts of the game. The thoughts are not parts of the game. They, they create the game, but they're not parts of the game. It's, this is not very important, but this is the view I'm going to take. And so a game of chess fits very nicely into Searle's X counts as Y in context C formula, because the game is a game because this, these particular physical movements of pieces count as a game. All right, so some people play blind chess. And here there are no pieces and there are no movements. Um, so chess is, is an example of the sort of small society where friendly individuals who know each other and share rules and so on and don't cheat. And where the case of blind chess proves that the game can occur without any documents or physical recording devices or the physical equivalent of recording devices which are the pieces of wood on the board, which document successively the state of the play. We don't need the board and we don't need the pieces and we don't need pieces of paper. Memories and speech acts will be sufficient. But then the question arises, in the case of a game of blind death, what is the game? Now, I think this is a really interesting problem. Um, so we know that there are thoughts and we know that there are speech acts. 
But I think that here too, neither the thoughts nor the speech acts are parts of the game. Ra, they, they merely represent the game. And um, the game is not here movements of pieces because there are no pieces and there are no movements. So the idea is that the chess game is something that is both abstract and historical at the same time in the case of blind chess. Normal chess is a set of physical movements that count as a game. Blind chess is a freestanding Y event. And uh, it has a history, it was played by certain people, but it has only quasi-mathematical properties. So as debts and prizes have quasi-mathematical properties. And I think probably normal chess is like that too. I think probably Searle is wrong even about normal chess. But I think he's right about presidents, cathedrals, and private life. All right, so... This is a debt. A debt is a a, um, a debt is a freestanding Y quality. It's the relational quality of two individuals or two legal persons, which, like a game of blind chess, is an abstract pattern tied to history, tied to certain actions, tied to certain thoughts, beliefs, memories, records, and so on. So, a game of blind chess is like a debt, ontologically speaking. Now. We couldn't apply the same kind of analysis to a, a war. There is no blind war. There is no speech act war. It's not a war if there are only speech acts. Now that may change. So that, that I talk to people regularly who think that future wars will be fought on the internet. Um, and that, that there, are pe there are whole commands of the military, which are based upon the idea that already many, many parts of wars take place in, in cyber reality rather than in physical reality. But for the moment, there could not be blind war. Now, but John Kearns now will have to say there could be blind poker. And I think he's wrong. So there could, I think that poker is such that you could not have speech act poker. But poker could be played in a small village where everyone knows each other and where they share the same memory um, rules and where no one cheats. So that's, my, that's what I have to prove now. I have to prove that friendly people who do not cheat could not play poker without records of some sort. Now, there are two senses of blind here. One sense is that you can't see your fellow poker players. Um, uh, and there is online poker. And there, there is even uh, a blind poker player uh, in Scotland. There is at least one blind poker player. But actually, he, does, he, he has special big print cards, so he's not completely blind. But there could be a completely blind person who plays online poker, probably. Although I'm not sure about that. I think, well, we'll see. So, and there is online poker. Online poker, you can't see the faces of the people you're playing. Now, I think an a, 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 a upstanding poker player would find online poker not really poker because most of what is uh, interesting about real poker is that you can read other people's faces and you can read their gestures and you can't do that when you play online poker. Um, not even with avatars. You, you, maybe the names help. But... All right, so I'm not interested in that sense of blind poker, the sense in which you can't see your opponents. Um, I'm assuming that in a small village, people could play poker uh, and see each other's opponents. And the, the issue is, would they need cards? Could you play poker without cards, just as you can play chess without pieces? And the re so in this sense of blind that I'm interested in, the reason why you can't see the cards is because there are no cards, just as in blind chess, there are no pieces. And there are no chips and there are no dollar bills to place bets with because chips and dollar bills would be documents. There are just thoughts, speech acts, and memory, and the perceptual experiences of seeing each other's faces. 
All right, so the problem against blind, the reason why there cannot be blind poker is not a problem of memory. So just as there can be blind chess, because really good chess players have really good memory for chess positions, so really good poker players have really good memory for poker plays. So they remember, in any case, what's going on in the game and what has been going on in the game, what's gone on in previous games. Um, there is a problem with regard to money. So the, the, the David Slansky, who wrote this book, The Theory of Poker, starts off on the very first page by insisting that the object of poker is to make money. It's not for fun. So we need money, or we need something like money. So the, the first question then is, could we play poker in a barter economy? So there are no, no IOU notes, no tokens. We would need it, first of all, to do this, we would need a dealer which, who is trusted by everyone in the village, or everyone who wants to play. And then each person gives the dealer the initial stake, let's assume it's one cow. They don't actually move any cows around. They, just, they put the cow in escrow and without documents. And then they bet. And they, they have to tell the dealer how much is that cow. They're betting. So that I raise your uh, hundred thousandth of a cow uh, by three hundred thousandths of a cow. And the dealer has to remember all of that. So the dealer has to have a really good memory. This is everyone around the table has to have a really good memory. Not just for the cards, but also for the bet. Then the dealer has to tell someone, well, the, everyone knows how much they have left. They all have the same initial stake, which is one cap. And then at the end of the game, it would presumably have to be all in, or you'd have to start butchering cows to 300,000 fractions. Somebody gets six cows. So he gets, wins five cows and gets his own cow back. So five cows are moved onto his field. So you could have a game of poker in a small village barter economy, provided no one cheats. So as soon as there is someone who might run away whining, saying, no, you can't have my cow, even though he lost, then the whole thing fails. And that's why poker, where people, I won't say that poker people are tend liable to cheat, but I will say that real poker involves placing your uh, your stakes physically on the table. And there's a very important visual component that you can see the chips. And there are all kinds of special rules if people want to play without chips. All right. But if everyone is known to everyone else and they are all friends and they're all trusted, then you could play poker. So it's not betting which is the problem. Although there is still a problem. And uh, the, the difference between chess and poker is that in chess, everything is in the open. So you can bluff in chess, but you bluff by making your opponent stop thinking about what your opponent can see. There's nothing hidden. Where in poker, you can bluff precisely because there is something hidden, which means that there are, there are two levels in poker. There is what is visible, and there is what is not visible. Now, if everyone is blind, <laughs> then you have to have two kinds of non-visible. Um, so cards have a face and a back. Chess pieces do not have a back. They only have a face. Now, I, can we have a game which requires partial concealment when all the players are in effect blind? I think actually even this problem we can solve, but it will be rather tricky. So first of all, we have to have a special dealer who is outside the game. And the dealer would have to have a, 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 some kind of um, way of communicating secretly with the player, which would presumably be some kind of earplugs in the player's ears. And then he would communicate with them wirelessly from the next room, because otherwise they would hear him speaking. He couldn't type because that would introduce documents inside the memory of the machine. He has to speak. Feature. The dealer would have to have a, a phenomenal memory just as the players do because the dealer has to remember what the cards are that he's dealt. And he didn't deal any cards. He gave people card labels. 
You have to remember exactly what labels you've given out because only some labels are left at any given stage. So, and he also needs to keep track of the bet, which we've already seen. Now, the, the dealer can communicate with the players while they are sitting in the room, but the players sometimes have to communicate to the dealer, and then both of them would have to leave the room. That, so when you discard cards, you don't show which cards you discarded, but you, the dealer would need to know which cards you've discarded. There's nothing to see because there are no cards. So you have to communicate that you've discarded such and such cards, and you can't do that by speaking in the room with the other players and then they know So you have to go outside. Um, now, in all of this, again, we're still assuming that people um, don't cheat. They do bluff. So bluffing is not cheating. It's lying, in a sense because you are trying to make your opponent believe that you have a better hand or a worse hand than the hand you really have. The, but the crucial problem isn't bluffing. It isn't concealment if you allow the, the secret communication devices. It's randomness. You can't play poker without randomness. The dealing has to be random. Now, that means that the dealer has to have a random number generator because if the dealer picked cards randomly from his own head, then patterns would be, come manifest in clever poker play. So we have to imagine extremely sophisticated, mathematically very acute poker players in a small village ruled by a barter economy could spot. <laughs> now, so. The cards, there are no cards. So the dealer has to use a randomness generator in order to generate labels and give out the labels to the, to the players secretly in each stage. Now, to do this, there has to be a recording device. This is the final slide. So the, the dealer has to know what cards have already been handed out. You can do that in his memory. But the random number generator has to know what cards have already been handed out. And for that, the random number generator has to record that information and then generate new random numbers on that basis. Now, it could be that the dealer even remembers from phase to phase in the game which cards have been handed out. Then he would have to reprogram all that information into the computer for it to generate the next deal, the next hand. And then the, even then, the, re, the device has to remember what the dealer is entering into the machine in each case. So in either case, either it has a recording device which records across the whole game, or it has a recording device which, rec which recalls from hand to hand. In either case, there has to be a recording device, and therefore, there has to be a document. Because the central processing unit has to record which cards have been given out. and so. The Kern's thesis is defeated, and with that, I rest my case. <laughs>